All right, folks, we're going to pull some stragglers outside, and we'll get started in just a bit. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're ready to get this show started. So, welcome to the 2019 City of Cape Coral Hurricane Seminar. My name is Riley Tuff. I'm an Emergency Management Coordinator with the City of Cape Coral. And um, before we get started tonight, I just wanna make sure we do some stretches to make sure we all wide awake and nice and aware. So let's, everybody, if we can get this, bring this arm like this and do some stretches this way. And let's bring this arm this way and do some stretches this way. And let's put our hand really high like this and we're gonna shake our hand and, all right. Thank you all for participating in that. Now I can say that I shook everybody's hand. <laughs> so uh, I wanna open up tonight by talking about how glad I'm here be a part of the city of Cape Coral. We very much value public safety, preparedness, and uh, our ability to respond to disasters. Our fire department has over 200 firefighters. Our police department has over 200 police officers. This shows an excellent dedication to our public safety and our ability to uh, have quick response times. In addition to that, uh, we uh, regularly practice disaster response scenarios. Just today, we actually had a uh, full-scale exercise, not a full-scale, a uh, tabletop exercise for our uh, department staff. So they would, uh, we brought all the key department heads in, our fire department, our police department, our public works, our utilities, and we all sat in a room and talked through a scenario uh, where we had to simulate what a response would be like. This is our second time doing this in two months. 
So we really want to sharpen our skills and our ability to respond, not just as first responders, but as a whole entire city. In addition to that, we've taken on the, uh, the process of continuity of operations planning. So I've personally met with reps from every single department, from finance to the city auditor to public works, and been working with them to develop what are called COOP plans. Basically, how do we operate in less than ideal situations? And so I've gotten buy-in from every single department, which is, uh, if you talk to other people across the state and across the nation about COOP planning, you'll find it's not usually that universally accepted. And of course, uh, my, my uh, heart and joy is the Cape Coral CERT program, the Community Emergency Response Team, which some of you might have seen their table out there. It's a group of over 200 active volunteers. Last year, we did over 7,000 hours of service, and we've won awards back-to-back -back years. Uh, last year, uh, we won a state award uh, um, at the, the Governor's Hurricane Conference. And this year, we won an award at the National Hurricane Conference uh, for our response efforts during Hurricane Irma and for our response uh, assistance up in the panhandle with Hurricane Michael. So from every aspect of the whole community here in uh, at Cape Coral, we have uh, buy-in and excellence in responding to disasters. Um, so I can talk forever about all the stats and figures and stuff about how the uh, city prepares, but I want you guys to hear from the key stakeholders in our city about the steps you can take to be prepared for this hurricane season. So uh, our first speaker tonight that I would like to introduce you to is actually our fire chief, uh, Chief Lamb. Would you like to take the stage? Good evening, folks. I'll be brief. Um, I know, just a quick poll of the audience. Who here was uh, in the city during Hurricane Irma? Maybe not physically, but at least if you lived here. Um, how about Hurricane Wilma? Anybody remember Hurricane Wilma? Yeah, a few less hands. How about Charlie? Back to those. Right, so hopefully it's another roughly 10 years before we have another uh, hurricane impact here in our area. Uh, however, uh, and uh, uh, Jim Farrell will go over all of uh, the forecasting stuff coming up for and that's a that's a great thing that we have uh, and Jim joining us. Um, however, they're predicting a slower season, uh, but it only takes one hurricane to ruin our year, right? And so, um, as bad as Hurricane Irma was for the city of Cape Coral, uh, it cost us about as a city about twenty million dollars to recover from Hurricane Irma. I kind of call it the great inconvenience of 2017. Um, it was not nearly as bad as Hurricane Michael, uh, as we saw in the Panhandle. Uh, the Cape Coral Fire Department actually sent resources up to the Panhandle to assist in that, and uh, Mexico Beach, those other areas were completely devastated. And so if we were to receive a, a very direct impact like that hurricane, um, it would be a disaster uh, for, the, for the city and how we respond. And as rather it's going to quickly over, uh, overrun the assets that we have available to respond to emergencies. It's important for you guys, I don't know why this keeps cutting in and out. Um, it's important for you guys to, uh, as a community, to help us by being prepared. Um, just after Hurricane Irma, we, didn't, we weren't able to respond to emergency calls. Police and fire winds reach a sustained 45 miles an hour. Uh, and for approximately 10 or so hours, we didn't respond. And during that time, we had about 100 emergency calls in waiting. Now, can you imagine that times longer? Uh, greater severity of, of damage. Uh, that's where we really are going to rely on our CERT team members, and so I'd encourage any of you tonight, if you want to take a more active role in our community on how to respond, uh, please uh, look at helping out in that area, how you can help yourself and help your neighbors, uh, because really we want to be a resilient community and how we can, and how we can prepare and respond uh, to that disaster. So. Uh, Quickly, they're going to go over all sorts of other things with you tonight. I welcome you here. I appreciate your time and effort uh, and being with us. And uh, please don't hesitate to, if you have any questions, to let one of uh, one of the staff members here know. Uh, we're grateful to have you. And uh, who's up next, Riley? Alvin. Uh, so that being said, um, as some of you, you folks might remember uh, Dr. Jesse Spiro. Uh, he is no longer with the city. He has moved on to, uh, I believe, for the Fort Lauderdale Airport area. And so um, we are very grateful to have uh, Alvin Henderson. I'll give you a quick bio intro if that's okay. Uh, Alvin came to us from uh, Allegheny County, Pittsburgh area, spent uh, a number of decades there in uh, fire and emergency management, uh, then spent a couple years in Okaloosa County near Pensacola as a public safety director there. And then most recently, we stole him away from Lee Health. And so we're grateful to have him here. Uh, we're coming to just about on a month. Uh, 
even here with the city, but uh, in the short time he's been here, um, he's really caught the vision of what we need to do as a city and is taking it uh, to the next level to progress our program. So, uh, Mr. Alvin Henderson. Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. I'm extremely excited to be here in Cape Coral. Uh, as I've looked at many different programs and have gone out on many field uh, activations, you know, you start to get a sense of how the community is prepared and responds to emergencies. And I find it very interesting and exciting to see how the emergency preparedness efforts here in Cape Coral are second to none. And I think Riley touched on the fact today of having about 60 people crammed into the Emergency Operations Center and working through a scenario to better prepare themselves for the next incident. And that says a lot about the department directors. Everyone is very busy. You know, there's a lot of things that you have to do on a day in and day out for your blue skies position within the city. But then to throw on a training exercise, and we've had them now in the EOC, what, right, three times within the last two months. It speaks volumes for the commitment to be prepared for emergencies within the city of Cape Coral. We've done weather exercises, and, you know, the, the group is so welcoming, I'm already saying we, you know, and it's uh, great to be part of a true team effort that looks at emergencies and plans on together, but trains together. And part of that training is embarking on what we call constant quality improvement. It's not saying that anything we've done up to this time is wrong, but we're always looking ways to improve our efforts, to be more efficient, to be able to handle that next large scale emergency or even a small emergency. And what starts to happen then is those large scale emergencies start to become small scale emergencies because you're so well prepared. And to see the directors and deputy directors and other staff members that are making up the EOC team really be engaged into an exercise today and talk through the situations and be open-minded of what we did today might not be the best way. Maybe if we did this, we could be better for the next response. And that's kind of the conversations that were going on within the EOC today. And that speaks volumes for yourselves too to be here because it takes all of us to be a well-prepared, resilient community. You know, what we try to shoot for is resiliency for our citizens, so you're prepared for those emergencies that uh, take place, to be informed, to have a two-way communication. You know, we want information from you as well as you want information from us. It does none of us any good to hold that information in a silo. So it's events like tonight that we work together to get information out to be better educated, be better prepared. And I just want to really call out our EM team. Uh, we have most everyone here today, you've already met Riley, we have Misha Jackson. Misha, if you could wave your hand in the back there. And also Thomas Evans. Now we already said about a busy day today of having this large tabletop exercise that we've actually interfaced with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, but that wasn't our only event today. Obviously we have this e uh, event this evening. We have another event going on this evening just over at our fire headquarters in our Emergency Operations Center is CERT team training. Frank Gonzalez is over there doing CPR training for our CERT team. So there's something that's always out there to engage people to be better prepared. The chief mentioned it, and I'll say it again, our CERT team is phenomenal. Uh, back in Allegheny County, I had a, a few CERT teams that really would step up in time of need. And I'm just amazed at how the CERT team here in Cape Coral is deeply engaged, not only into emergency operations, but day-to-day -day activity in our emergency operations center as well. They're in there doing typical office work, for example. That talks about the caliber of citizens and the people that we have here in Cape Coral. So give yourselves a round of applause for that effort as well. <laughs> a little bit about technology. You know, uh, one of the things that we look at is how do we improve ourselves? Uh, information is golden in times of emergencies. It's golden during everyday life for us as well. The key is how we tie that information in what we call blue skies or our everyday positions and how we look at that information during an emergency. So some of the things that we're working on is a program called Web EOC that allows us to look at our information not only from a daily basis but information we need to be very proactive during emergencies and sharing that information throughout the city. 
but also going up and having that information report up to the county emergency management, public safety department, and then also to the Florida Division of Emergency Management. So that was some of the activity that we're looking at today, but also looking to advance as we move forward to embrace technology and use it as a uh, total resource for us of information sharing. And we talk about our website and Facebook pages of trying to share social media, but there's other issues out there that we have to look at, so we're meeting everyone's informational needs. So it's some of the things that we're looking at on a daily basis within our emergency management office. A lot of information ties on hurricanes, obviously. But we also have to remember what also is tied into our hurricanes. You know, everyone gets prepared for the, the big push of the hurricane, but then all of a sudden become complacent with the high winds, the storm surge, and other weather events, whether it's heavy rain and flooding, compounded by a storm surge, which might be during high tide, but also tornadoes that can occur as well. So those are the other things that we have to think about together to make sure that we're looking at the entire spectrum of risk that's associated to us during that hurricane season. It might not be that big hurricane that comes through. It could actually be a subtropical storm that produces tornadoes, heavy rain. So we want to make sure that we're sharing all that information with you here this evening and have that information available to you as well. As we look at the technology sides and, and lessons learned, the county's looking at the uh, evacuation zones. And typically, the evacuation zones used to always be A, B, C, D, E. I think I covered them all, and there's an N, G, am I right? <laughs> I'm not forgetting anything. But also, what they're starting to look at now is not those evacuation zone lettering, but storm surge, because there's so much data now that we're looking at on past incidents in that storm surge and what that meant to areas that should have been evacuated or might have been more efficient to not do such a large scale evacuation. So those are things that we keep on looking at in emergency management and whether it's a training exercise like we had today or a real world event, taking the information that is gathered from that event or exercise and putting it into use for us to be better prepared, better informed as we move into emergency response into the future. So I, I don't want to take away from the other speakers' time this evening, but I, again, I just want to, again, thank you for your efforts of being part of our team, in essence, by coming out here this evening and taking time from your personal schedule to get better informed and educated on what we're looking at, how we get engaged into our operations as we enter into hurricane season, which again, yes, it starts June 1st, but it can happen anytime. There are storms that occur any time, any uh, month throughout the year. Yes, we know that we're a little bit more prone to them in September, October time frame, but we always want to be prepared. So if you take one piece of advice from my section of uh, tonight, take away that uh, thought and the concept of always being prepared and always looking out for yourself, but also looking out for your neighbor as well. Again, if I could ever be of any assistance to you as the new Emergency Management Division Manager, please reach out to myself or our phenomenal Emergency Management team that we have in place here in the city of Cape Coral. Thank you again for your time tonight. Riley? So for our next guest speaker, I kind of want to put some, some preface to it in that when a hurricane comes, it's actually two different disasters we have to face. The first one is obviously the winds and the rain and the storm and the impact. But there's a second disaster that occurs afterwards, which is the recovery process. And a whole new set of uh, problems uh, start to face us. And so to talk about some of the things we can do to be prepared and to uh, protect ourselves, we have uh, Bill Johnson from the Cape Coral Construction Industry Association. Bill. Come on. Got to love technology. Here we go. Hit the uh, right button. Got it. Okay, now that we got everything going. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Uh, like Riley said, my name is Bill Johnson, Jr. I'm the executive director for the Cape Coral Construction Industry Association. Uh, just a little bit about what the CCCI is. We are a nonprofit association that was established in 1971. 
Uh, we're a nonprofit group that advocates on behalf of the construction industry within the city of Cape Coral. So what that means is we work as a liaison with the building industry to help the end user, you the homeowner, to make sure that all the codes, ordinances, and everything is all right when building your house and to make sure that all the housing goes smoothly so that we can continue to grow our great city. Uh, I've been doing this presentation for a couple years and I enjoy it because I get to give you the homeowner kind of what to look forward to leading up to the storm and like Riley said after the storm which is the most important part of uh, the recovery phase so kind of getting into it obviously always we have to be prepared um, you know with your hurricane preparedness kits everything that you do to get ready for the storm it's very key to make sure that you have all that in place kind of looking at your pre-storm plan <coughs> excuse me that was actually a picture that was sent to me before Irma. What we do with our industry is we kind of police all of our builders to make sure that if there is an impending storm coming in, that all of the job sites, everything in the areas are cleaned up because as you can see that's stacked on that roof there, those are roof shingles. Well, on any other given normal day, that would be a fine thing. That roof would be installed the next day, but with a storm coming in with a potential 100 mile an hour winds, you now have a bunch of projectiles that are on the top of that roof that could potentially be thrown right into your house. So we as the CCCI work along with the city code enforcement, our building department, to make sure that when we do have situations like that on the commercial building side, we work with the contractors to make sure that they do secure all their job sites, make sure any loose debris or any material is taken care of and stored so that if we do get an occurrence like we did with Irma, we are not putting projectiles that potentially could harm your home. One of the things that we ask you to do the same thing with your residence is to secure it. Make sure that all of your lawn furniture, make sure all of your outdoor items, everything's stowed. If you have hurricane shutters, make sure they're put up. If you have plywood, if you're doing anything to make sure that your house is prepared for that storm, we recommend that the pre-storm time is when you do that. Um, one of the big things that I kind of touched on it last year was your pool. Most people think that, oh, with the storm coming in, I'm going to let a bunch of water out of my pool so that uh, when it rains, my pool will fill up and it won't get overflowed and everything will be fine. The one thing that you need to remember is we recommend that you don't empty your pool simply because by emptying your pool, what you're now creating is hydrostatic pressure. When you get a hurricane event come through, and I'm not the expert on it, our chief meteorologist will be telling you about that later, you get those pressures and we've actually seen situations where those pool shells have actually kind of popped right out of the ground. Similar to what you saw after Irma with some of the seawall damage on some of the older seawalls that we had. When the water was taken out of the canal, those concrete seawalls didn't have anywhere to go and that hydrostatic pressure towed them out at the bottom. So it's very, very important that if you do have a pool, don't listen to what you see on the internet, don't empty your pool, let it overflow, you will be fine. Because the last thing you'd want is an additional damage of your pool popping out of the ground. Um, really, Securing the house in your residence is the most important thing. Then the next thing you go through, if you're still hunkering down and going through the storm, when you get past the storm comes the most important part is your emergency repairs. That was actually Cape Coral Parkway when I was out with the police department after Hurricane Irma. That's right in front of, I believe, uh, right by the McDonald's on Cape Coral Parkway, tree down in the road. You're always gonna wanna do your initial assessment. Normally we recommend when it's safe to go out, when the storm is passed, but you want to go around and check your house, your most valuable possession. Make sure that everything's secure on that. Make sure that they're, you know, be very, very careful because there could be down power lines in the area. There could be standing water. You don't know. Be very cautious when you're making that initial assessment on your house to make sure that everything is okay. Secure anything that may have been torn off, ripped away. Look at any potential roof damage. Um, most importantly, preventing water intrusion. Um, you never know what happens. We were very lucky when Irma came through. It was really a, we could have gotten a lot worse than many other areas in Lee County did get. So securing that, preventing that water intrusion is something that's key. After all that initial thing, what we went through, kind of just to give you what we went through post Irma, you can see in that picture, that's a shot, a overhead shot from Google Maps of one of the streets in Cape Coral. Blue tarps, blue tarps were everywhere. We had a lot of roof damage. 
The city was very gracious when it came time after Irma where they allowed a lot of the permits that you normally would pay a fee for. They gave a grace period where they weren't charging permit fees on roofing, fences, things of that nature to help the citizens recover some of their costs. The city will go out and they will do their official commercial damage assessment on all the buildings and everything post the storm. But same thing again, you want to look at your own residence to make sure that all the damage and everything is something that is mitigatable and you can work with. So the city does a great job of working with you on the permitting and everything. But what we get into in pretty much the last point, and I can't stress enough, is unlicensed contractors. This is the most important thing of anything that you can hear tonight, unlicensed contractors. Because unfortunately, when we run into a natural disaster of this nature, whether it be something with Irma, whether it be what Michael did to the panhandle, <coughs> you're going to get a group of people that are going to prey off of you. It's what they do. They don't care about you. All they're looking to do is take advantage of a situation. You have to look at the situation where you have roof damage in your house, water's pouring in, you're trying to get it fixed. This is your home, this is where all your memories are, this is where you raise your family at. It's a very highly emotional time. What you're gonna see is you'll see that these people will come out, they'll say, no problem, we can tarp your roof, we'll take care of it right away. And then we'll take care of that, but then we're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk to you and we'll help you fix your roof. Well, do you have any license? Well, no, no, we'll take care of it, don't worry, we'll get the permits handled, everything. We'll give you a price, and nine times out of ten, they'll prey upon those emotions that you see. What we do is, everything that you need to be done needs to have a permit. That's not a city ordinance, but that's a building code. Florida Building Code states that any major work that you have to do to your house, whether it be roof, electrical, plumbing, anything of that nature, requires a building permit to do that. When they tell you, oh, don't worry, we can do this repair without a permit, nine times out of ten, they're wrong. You need a permit to fix that. Poor workmanship. We ran into a situation where the CCCIA works very closely with the building department on not only the contractor side, but like I said, the homeowner side. We had a homeowner who had a contractor come in from out of town, put a roof, re-roofed the whole house, and did it wrong. They had to rip the entire roof off and redo it because it wasn't done to the Florida Building Code. The property owner becomes liable for any injuries on workers. This is one of the things that when I do talks to different various groups, the best example that I can use, tree damage, or even just tree trimming. When you see these guys riding around and they have come onto your house and say, you know, I see you got six palm trees in your backyard and they look like they need to be cut. I can go ahead and cut them down for 20 bucks a tree. You're like, oh, that's a great deal. I'll go ahead and do it. What you don't realize by not asking them if they're a properly licensed contractor is that if that person gets on your property, falls off a ladder and hurts themselves, they can now sue you for all of their medical damages and you could be held liable for that. Because every contractor who does work within the city, state, or county has to not only have workman's comp insurance, but it has to have liability insurance. These are costs that these contractors incur to make sure that if injuries were to happen on your property, they're covered and the damage and the burden doesn't fall on you. Um, there's no recourse. We work with code enforcement. We've seen situations where these predatory contractors will come in and they will just go through and do a shoddy job. They'll take a deposit. They'll say that they're going to buy materials. Then they don't show up. You, as a homeowner, then try to get recourse from that. And nine times out of ten, these people are gone and you're out the money. Not trying to scare any of you, but it is very, very important that when you look at something like this, it's not, I always tell people, don't be afraid to ask someone for their license because these people have worked very hard to get this. They've worked very hard to establish a reputation. So if we're asking them for a simple thing, are you a licensed contractor? Can you give me multiple references? It's something that can save you from potentially running into a situation where you're on the hook or something doesn't get complete. And a lot of times you won't get warranties from that. One of the things that uh, we stress is that if someone comes in and does work on your job without a permit and they happen to do that work shoddy and say it's an electrician comes out, doesn't have a license, doesn't pull a permit and does work in your electrical box and you wind up having a failure and your box catches on fire. The insurance company is going to come out and the first thing they're going to do is check to see if what? There was a permit pulled, was it a licensed contractor? 
If there wasn't, then they can deny that claim. So when dealing with tragedy and dealing with situations like this, when we're dealing with natural disasters, always ask for a permit and ask if they have that. Ask the contract, like I said, ask if they're licensed that. Make sure you see a license number. General contractors have to have their license number on all their vehicles, all their business cards. That's what that GC number is. That is actually their state general contractor's license number. If they don't have it on their vehicle, if they don't have it on their business card, I would be very, very wary about having them do work on your home. Always deal, you know, I tell people, always be wary of the deal that sounds too good to be true. If it's too good to be true, nine times out of ten, it's not. Obtain more than two estimates. We always pr tell people, practice safe practices. It might take a little bit longer. You might be inconvenienced a little bit more. But to do the proper homework and diligence to get multiple estimates when dealing with this could save you from having to deal with something that you could lose your life savings, you could lose your how. I mean, it's, we've seen horror stories when it comes with this. You know, it's, like I said, it's not meant to scare everyone, but we really would let, you know, that's our advocacy side with dealing with the residents and the homeowners is do your homework because why we're here to work for the contractors, we're also here to protect you because there's people that don't respect that and we'll play on that. You always be careful of door-to-door -door salesmen. If you notice anything suspicious, call code compliance. We worked with the code enforcement office. What you see right there, it's unlicensed at capecoral.net. That is an actual email address that will send it right to the code department. The number underneath there, 239-242-3873. That is a direct line to the code enforcement office where you can file a complaint. Um, we, like I said, we work very well with code. Um, Rich Carr, our code compliance manager, does a great job of making sure he protects you, the homeowners, and works with us, the industry, to do that. And that being said, I'd like to thank you all for this time. You will get through it if there is a situation like that, but we always say do your due diligence, always ask questions, never be afraid to. And uh, if I will be around afterwards, if any of you all have any other questions, but thank you once again for your time. Thank you for coming out tonight. I'll turn it back over to Riley. Thank you, Bill. Our next guest speaker is actually a household name. He's been doing uh, weather information here for nearly 30 years in the Southwest Florida community. So you know him, I know him, we all love him. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Farrell. Thanks, Riley, Alvin, thanks for the invite. Uh, boy, here we go again. I've lived in Cape Coral 38 years. <laughs> and I'm old. I'm old. I'm getting there. I love it here. I haven't been scared off by hurricanes yet. And I don't want you to be scared off either. Uh, well, we are not here to scare you at all. We're just here to give you the lay of the land and let you know what you might be up against so that you can formulate the best plan you can. And before we get into some other specifics, let me try to tell you what a hurricane is, what a tropical depression, a tropical storm is. In the summer months, June through November, certain conditions come together that allow hurricanes to form. We don't see them in the winter months for many reasons. One is that the water has to be warm. Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, tropical Atlantic, 80 degrees or more, not just at the surface where you swim in and around, but down to about 50 feet or more. Because as a hurricane forms over the warm water, and that's where it gets its energy, it creates wind, and the wind creates turbulence in the water. So the, if there's cool water underneath the surface, it gets brought to the surface, and now the hurricane's <laughs> not enough energy. I need warm water. So we need a deep layer of warm water, and we need calm-like conditions on top. That's why when we're in a strong El Nino year, which creates a lot of wind in the atmosphere, we have fewer hurricanes. Because as they try to grow up and get bigger, uh, they run into wind shear and they can't stay in the structure that requires them to be in to be strong. 
So generally what we're looking for are clouds out over the tropical uh, basin and uh, the weakest of the systems that we're probably going to call your attention to will be a tropical wave. That's just clouds and no wind. Some rain, some clouds, not windy. But if conditions are favorable, the water stays warm, the upper air pattern is light with light wind, then that can become a tropical depression. The air pressure will drop, we will start to get a counterclockwise circulation, and then if conditions remain favorable, you will see the wind speed increase, and once it hits 39 miles per hour, it becomes a tropical storm. At that point, it gets a name. Keeps a name if it goes on to become a hurricane, and hurricanes start at 74 miles per hour, and we generally are looking at five categories of hurricane strength. One, two, three, four, and five. Five is a lot more powerful than a one. So when the conditions are ripe, we can have tropical storms and hurricanes. Now, if they all stay out over the Atlantic, even if there's 10 hurricanes, which would be an above average season, I don't care. <laughs> if there's only one hurricane and it comes right up the Caloosahatchee into your canal, that's an active season to us. So no matter what the forecast is for the season, and right now the forecast for the entire six month hurricane season is for a near normal season, 13 tropical storms, five hurricanes, two major hurricanes. It really doesn't matter how many will form. What matters is where they're gonna go. And we can't tell you that today. There's really a lot of skill in predicting how many will form but there's very little skill in telling you in advance where they're going to go and which land area is going to be affected. So let's talk about Cape Coral. How many of you are spending your very first hurricane season with us in southwest Florida? Excellent. Newcomers, hey, welcome. <coughs> this is where you should be. You know you moved to a Cape. Ah, that's part of the problem. <laughs> you know what a Cape is? I'm not talking about Superman Cape. I'm talking about a landmass cape. We're surrounded by water on three sides. We've got the Caloosahatchee to the east, Mount Lache Pass to the west, and the mouth of the Caloosahatchee to the south. Hurricanes are made up of three troublemakers, wind, rain, and surge. And in Cape Coral, surge becomes a more important facet of hurricane preparation than in other parts. Lehigh Acres residents don't care about storm surge. They shouldn't. They're not going to ever have any. But they'll have wind and rain. We could have wind, rain, and surge. And with 100 miles of direct access canals in this beautiful city, I like to think of it as the eighth wonder of the world, who, who are these crazy guys and gals who decided to, to man make all these canals and lakes out of nothing? the expense to do that, the engineering to do that precisely. You get up in a, a look at a drone footage or a uh, airplane or helicopter, you look down on the Cape, it's perfect. What a project. But with 100 miles of direct access canals that lead out to the river, in most cases, or Matt Lachey Pass, that provides a conduit for salt water to get to you a lot easier than if there were no canals. So what's storm surge? Storm surge is the Gulf of Mexico. It's salt water. And the storm surge is created by the wind. Remember, we've got this counterclockwise hurricane. There's the wind blowing like this around the eye. And the wind pushes the water into the cape. Now, worst case scenario, an Irma-like hurricane, or a, one that was stronger, Ir Irma was a four that became a three, but a powerful hurricane that is accompanied by storm surge, which can be 10, 20, 30 feet high at the highest with waves, and up to 50 miles wide in some cases. If that storm surge goes where the hurricane goes, and it will, and the hurricane deposits that storm surge at the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River, that water is going to go 
in the easiest path it can find, and that is going to be spreading out up the river into the canals on both sides of the Caloosahatchee, and you're going to have the threat of rising salt water from storm surge. Usually, not always, usually stronger hurricanes have more storm surge than weaker hurricanes. Anybody here in 04 for Hurricane Charlie? Charlie hit really uh, Charlotte County and DeSoto. In Lee County, we were here, I was on the air, and it was howling, it was rocking and rolling. You know, Wink TV is kind of like in a tuna can. Don't tell them I said that. It's an old building, it's from 1954, but it's reinforced, it's safe, but it was rattling and shaking. It was tropical storm force wind in downtown Fort Myers, but it was 174 miles per hour in gusts in Charlotte County. So Charlotte County really can say they were in a category four we can't say that in Cape Coral, Lee County. But when Charlie came ashore, it was very compact. A lot of wind in that buzzsaw path that it was on. Super destructive wind. But it didn't make a lot of surge. Six to eight feet tops. And that was along the barrier islands. Because it was moving so fast. Charlie was moving 25 miles an hour. Not much rain, and the wind didn't last that long. And the surge didn't have time to, there wasn't enough time for the surge to build up. Plus it was very compact. But then it comes along a Katrina, instead of Charlie's five mile diameter eye, itty bitty teeny tiny in structure, Katrina has a 60 mile wide diameter eye, which means when its wind is blowing counterclockwise, oh, it scoops up a lot of water. And Charlie just pushed a little water into the coast. So even though Charlie was a Category 4, it didn't make a lot of surge. But in general, usually the more powerful hurricanes create more storm surge. Now, if you uh, are a Cape Coral resident, and I'm expecting that almost all of you are, it's kind of easy for storm surge when you are told to evacuate, you should. So why do we talk about this in the month of May? So you can think today, where are we going, honey? If we are told to evacuate, let's figure that out today. Not at the last minute when the clouds are rolling in, the wind's picking up, and everybody's out of their mind. You can go to a Red Cross approved shelter, which are generally schools in Cape Coral. I don't want you to do. There's no air conditioning, there's no fans, there's people of all ages, little ones running around, and it's just not comfortable. You're only given private space on the floor that's about the size of a sleeping bag. That's yours, can't get in my space. But um, you gotta bring your own bedding. So it's like we like to say, it's not the love boat, it's a lifeboat. So where do you go? If you're told to evacuate, you need to think friend or relative that doesn't live too far from us that has not been told to evacuate. If you know anybody like that, stay friendly. Please do yourself a favor. Check in on them once in a while. Hey, how you doing? Do you mind if we stay with you for a night or two? Because hurricanes are not long-lasting events. The weather part is not. It'll be sunny and calm like this one day. The next day it will be windier and windier and if the hurricane is moving at the average pace of about 12 to 14 miles per hour, it's really a one and a half day event of bad weather. And then you have the chance to return to your home if it's deemed safe to do so. So friend or relative in county or in city, I'd go for that, hotel space, in county. A lot of people have the mindset that if a hurricane comes and I am told to evacuate, I need to go to Atlanta, I need to go to Orlando, I'm going back to Michigan, I will see the grandkids while we're at it. Well, that's okay, but you don't have to go that far. You don't. So think about local, 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 just get to a higher elevation that's in a safer spot. And you'll be safe from the surge even if your house or condo is having storm surge in the front or backyard. So that's the surge. Then there's wind and then there's rain. Well, wind is obvious. Everybody knows hurricanes are full of wind. They're all the pictures we show on TV with 
meteorologists or news people standing out in a hurricane, which they shouldn't be doing. It's in the wind, right? Very windy. But fortunately, you live in a state that probably has the best building codes for wind resistance than any other state in the country. Not everybody around the Gulf of Mexico or Atlantic seaboard has the tough building codes that Florida does. So if you're in a newer home, you're probably in a real safe spot for wind if you put your shutters up and you have a strong garage door or reinforce your garage door. When Charlie came through in 04, we surveyed Charlotte County and it was mind boggling. There were homes that were, the roof was gone, but the one next to it was fine. And then a couple houses down, the roof was gone or half gone. And we noticed a couple of things. One thing we noticed in Charlotte County is that those homeowners that did not have shutters or lost their garage door because it either gets blown in or sucked out, were the ones that lost the roof in most cases. Makes sense if you think about the physics behind it. You have a hundred, or in the case of Charlie, 125 to 140 mile an hour wind. You have a breach in your house. The garage door is actually the biggest window in your house to a hurricane. You lose that or you lose a few windows or even one window. Now you have wind coming into your house at 100 plus miles per hour. It's trying to blow your living room up like a balloon. You've got pressure coming in that's putting pressure on the walls and the roof. And then, of course, we live in homes that have roofs that look like airplane wings to a hurricane. So as the air flows over your roof, there's lift created there. Your roof wants to go. But thank goodness for the codes and the construction that is done. We've got hurricane clips and straps, et cetera, and we hang on to our roof. But you really need to make sure you don't lose any windows or your garage door to keep the wind out and to stay safe. It will be the ride of your life like Irma was for those who were a little farther east. We had a guy on TV live. It was a, a, a telephone call. The phone system stayed up. He was in a stero, and I saw it on radar. He was in the eye wall. Irma was coming in to where he was. And he was, you know, in his voice, you could, oh, it's really scary. And you could hear some noise in the background. It is, but he's going to be okay because he had the shutters, he had the reinforced garage door, and after the wind died down, he was fine. Generally, you're not going to be told to evacuate for wind. It can happen, but mostly when you're told to evacuate, it's because of storm surge issues. So we've got the surge, we've got the wind, and then what about the rain? Well, rain can be a problem in Cape Coral on any summer afternoon, depending on where you're driving. I spent many a uh, commute over Diplomat Parkway, and after a summer downpour, that road would flood quite often. It was expected. Cape Coral Parkway used to be like that. I think they've improved it since. But there are certain areas that, oh, they're going to have temporary flooding from heavy rain. That's just one day's worth of rain. Now, with a tropical depression, a tropical storm, or a hurricane, the rain can be inconsequential, like with Charlie, six inches. Cape Coral, we get five inches in an afternoon every once in a while. But Charlie was moving fast. If you have a slow-moving tropical depression, you will get more wind, um, you'll get more rain than if you have a fast-moving hurricane. They're all super soggy, soaky systems. But if it's moving slowly, you're getting a lot of rain where you live. It's not getting spread out over a wide area. There was a tropical storm, Allison, years ago in the Texas uh, coast uh, nearby Houston. It was a tropical storm. It went over land. It wandered. It stalled. It took four days to get out of there. After four days of tropical storm, Allison rain, they had communities that had between 40 and 60 inches of rain. Fresh water flooding, not storm surge, that's salt water. Talking about fresh water flooding. So those are the three troublemakers, wind, rain, and surge. And a lot of how much of any one of those we get 
is not only going to depend on how strong the hurricane or weather system is, but which way it's moving and what its structure is. Is it small like Charlie? You put it in your pocket. It's so small. Or is it big like Katrina or Wilma, 60 mile, and, uh, 60 mile wide uh, diameter eyes? So the structure is important and the track is so important. And nobody was here in 1960, right, for Hurricane Donna? Anyone? Sometimes there's a hand. Well, Donna came through, Category 3 hurricane, over downtown Naples and over downtown Fort Myers. Met many people who were here then. They were this tall at the time in most cases, but they remember in 1960, Donna came through, everything got blown around, and then it got sunny and calm. They went out, and they started cleaning up. Well, they were in the eye. Here comes the back half of the hurricane, and all of a sudden, it's not calm and sunny anymore. But what was more interesting about Donna was, if this is the Caloosahatchee, Fort Myers is here, Cape Coral is here, Donna went right over downtown Fort Myers, counterclockwise circulation, and the wind pushed the Caloosahatchee out. Water went down. Storm surge was not a problem in Cape Coral. If anything, there wasn't enough water in the canal. There are people who were there at the time who tell me years later, you know, you could have walked across the Caloosahatchee. It was, the water was so low in 100 mile an hour wind. Good luck. <laughs> but it depends on the track. Had that exact same hurricane been a little farther west, same counterclockwise circulation pushes the water up the Caloosahatchee and there's flooding on both sides. That's the good luck we had with Irma as a Cape Coral resident. If Irma had been 20 to 40 miles farther west, it would have been in a position to bring in the storm surge and it could have been a 10 foot or greater storm surge in parts of Cape Coral. But we were lucky, because at the last minute, it stayed a little farther east, near I-75. And we didn't get the storm surge we could have. Same system, but it's a matter of where is it in relation to our community? Is it pushing water onshore, or is it blowing the water away from us? So storm surge, rain, and um, wind, obvious issues. Well, I have probably gone over my 15 minutes, right? <laughs> I usually run a stopwatch and I didn't do it this time. But anyway, I'm gonna hang around and I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys have as well. But uh, in summary, you know, I'm not here to scare you. I've been here forever. I don't want you to go home from this seminar and put up a for sale sign. I, if you do, will you tell me first because I'd probably get a good deal. <laughs> now, I don't have enough money to capitalize on that anyway, but don't run away, just get ready. Get ready, we'll be okay. You'll, you'll make it through. Nobody should ever die in a hurricane. It does happen though. And the last statistic I'll leave you with is most people that die from a hurricane die after the hurricane has left and the sun is out and the wind is down. They're dying because they're in a hurry to get life back to normal. They're up on their roof and they shouldn't be. They fall through the roof, they fall off the roof, they have heart attacks and strokes doing too much. Carbon monoxide poisoning is another issue. So be prepared before, during, and after the event. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jim. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Our final guest speaker for tonight is from the Florida Alliance of Safe Homes. It's an organization that specializes in doing outreach um, to uh, local communities to give them information on preparing their homes and being ready to be uh, pre prepared for hurricane season. Uh, specifically, um, I will have them here tonight to talk about their hashtag Hurricane Strong initiative. So, Mike Ramoldi, can you come up and give, give, give us a round of applause? Thank you, Riley. Good evening, everyone. So, so Jim is a tough act to follow. I mean, knowledgeable, on-camera, experienced meteorologist. And then you got me. But I have been told I have a great face for radio, so, you know. We'll just. 
leave that where it is. Uh, my name is Mike Romaldi, as Riley said. I'm with the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. We are a nonprofit headquartered out of Tallahassee, Florida. I live in the Tampa area, and uh, I have experience working in county government. I used to work for the building department in Hillsborough County. So everything that Bill said about unlicensed contractors is 110% true. So I'm a contractor myself in the state of Florida. Do not hire an unlicensed one, period, no matter how great the deal is, because it's just going to be a huge can of worms later. That being said, uh, I want to give you a little bit of information. As Riley said, Riley and I met at the National Hurricane Conference recently, and uh, he asked me to come and speak about our Hurricane Strong initiative. Uh, I will tell you, Flash does a lot of work with disaster preparation, disaster safety, home mitigation, home preparation. I won't go into all the details, but you can learn about all of this at our website, www.flash.org. There's way more information than you can share in a whole uh, day and a half, let alone 15 minutes. So I'll just invite you to visit our website whenever you have a chance. So uh, as I said, Riley and I met at the National Hurricane Conference, and one of the new things that Flash has is what we call our Hurricane Strong Initiative. Uh, the idea that it's encouraging communities to be what we call Hurricane Strong. And I want to read you our news briefing on it, and then I'll give you a little background. So the Hurricane Strong community designation is a new element of the National Hurricane Resilience Initiative presented by FEMA, Flash, NOAA, and the Weather Channel. Hurricane Strong was created in 2016 to improve hurricane preparedness, mitigation, and overall readiness through increased public awareness and engagement. Communities chosen for this honorary recognition meet specific criteria such as high performance scores on the ISO Building Code Effectiveness Grading Schedule, BSEGS, community rating system, and other measures such as the NOAA Storm Ready Community designation. Program began in 2018 officially, and three counties designated so far are Leon County, Florida, Miami-Dade County, Florida, and Chatham County, Georgia. So the general idea is we are encouraging communities to apply, send in their information for this designation. So immediately, I know many of you are asking, I can tell she's going to ask me already, what's in this for the community? I'd love to say I showed up with a huge pot of gold and hand out a pot of gold for the community. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. But what we do is we show up with a plaque, present it to your community, and the reason that this is beneficial or helpful is it helps your community identify what you are already doing for the residents of the community. It helps folks like Riley and Alvin identify, hey, we're already doing this or we're already doing that. And we, we, at the hurricane conference, we had our three other communities come and speak. And immediately you could see other attendees in the audience go, ooh, that's a great idea. Hey, we're already doing this, but let's steal this idea. And you know what? When it comes to community benefits and preparation, stealing ideas from other communities is totally okay. The community in Georgia said, well, we have created an app where we can have our residents just log into the app and they can see things like where water is given out, what shelter is already full, what shelter is available, where I can take my pets. And there's a couple people in the audience going, ooh, I like that idea. We're going to take that. And that's okay. So the general idea of working towards receiving the Hurricane Strong designation is it helps your community identify what you're already doing. But it also makes it public because if the residents and the citizens of the community aren't aware of it, is it really beneficial? So uh, we're working directly with Riley. The idea is we're, we're hoping to get Cape Coral, City of Cape Coral, designated as a Hurricane Strong community here relatively soon. So you may see me back in these same chambers one day presenting a plaque to everybody, and hopefully that's going to occur sometime soon. So thanks for the time. A big thank you for the invite to have us come down and talk, Riley, uh, and I appreciate your time this evening. All right, folks. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. So that concludes the portion of our evening where we're going to have the guest speakers come up. Um, I wanted to make sure we set aside from question and answers for people who are here if you have any questions. Um, so I'll open the floor. I have an extra microphone over here. And we can ask from any of the guest speakers that are presented tonight. Going once. <laughs> Going twice. All right. Questions. All right. What's your name? It's Jules. Uh, it's just 
a question about landline versus just uh, mobile devices because everybody gets rid of their phones. Is there any validity to having a landline at this point? Nope. Choice? I don't know. Fire department? Great question. One of the issues we're looking at is two-way communication with our citizens. Uh, we're embarking upon a program uh, that we're partnering with Lee County. We'll be launching it here hopefully within the next month. Uh, the program is actually a, a roll down from the state, Florida Alert, Lee County adopted, it's called Alert Lee. We're embracing that here within Cape Coral. It will allow you to sign up and provide your mobile numbers. It also works off of national white pages, yellow pages, and also information that would be plugged into 911 centers. So you'll get the information whether it's pushed out to cell tower sites, if there is a evacuation or shelter in place order that goes out, that information could be pushed out from a cell tower perspective, so a geographical area, but also we can get incident specific into certain what we call in the, the EM world polygons on, on a GIS map layer. So if it's a small area that's affected and we're only trying to hit a small area, we can send that alert based on that small footprint, if you will, from a GIS perspective. And then it will go into the system and it will pull white page information, yellow page information, and also the information you provide when you sign up for the system as well to provide your personal cell phone information. So it's just one of the areas that we're looking at uh, expanding into as we uh, enter into the 2019 hurricane season here. There will be more information as we solidify that arrangement with Lee County. Uh, it's kind of in place right now from a county perspective. By us joining it as a uh, municipality uh, entering into Lee counties and really building it within Cape Coral, it's allowing our citizens to have an added layer of alertness through that process. So it is embracing the, you know, the newer technology that's out there, but also the, the National Weather Service, as they push out through the National uh, Weather Alert radio system, they can get specific on cell tires as well. Okay, great question. Okay. Increase the battery power at the towers? The towers went down the charge. Sure. Correct. And it's a great question. And I apologize if you didn't hear it. I didn't get the microphone there in time. Uh, the question is, what about the cell towers? What's the resiliency of the cell towers? A lot of the uh, systems that are on those towers are looking at hardening those facilities. They're looking at generators that are connected to them. They're looking at taking advantage of um, solar energy as well. So there's multi-layers that they're looking for for lines of redundancy to power up those cell towers, but also they're looking at mobile cells on wheels, which are self-sustained units that they can come into a community and set up those cells on wheels and pretty much augment if there's a tower outage or to build that signal strength up as well. So they are realizing that many people are dropping those traditional landlines and one is to harden the facilities, multiple lines of electricity capability, so UPS systems, solar power, generators, and then finally bringing in cells on wheels to try to rapidly bring that system back up. Hi, this is for Jim. Uh, the models that uh, all of you uh, weather folks work with, there seem to be all over the place, but it seems like the European model that everybody quotes seems to hit it more often. Is there something that causes that model to be more accurate than everybody else? There, there is no one model that's always the best, but the European is usually the one that's in the ballpark or the best, and it was last year. It was very good. Um, it's just better math. You know, that's a European model. There's meteorologists and scientists and physicists who build that, and we have our own in the U.S., and uh, it has, uh, it, I think it's the best. If I see a discrepancy between the European and another model, I'm going there until it does me wrong. 
I think this is for Jim as well. Um, can you describe what storm surge starts from? Is it street level? Is it where the water is? When we're on television giving you what the Hurricane Center gives us, which is the inundation forecast, how high is the water going to be from a particular hurricane? Two years ago in the case of Hurricane Irma, there was a time when the inundation graphic and the message from the Hurricane Center and from emergency management was 10 to 15 feet above ground level. And that was the first year we ever used those terms. In the past, it was always in relation to mean sea level, right? And boy, was everybody confused. I was surprised, you know? I mean, the, there's the ground. That's kind of easy to find out where the ground is. But we got all kinds of questions from folks who just couldn't get their head around the fact that, what do you mean the ground? But my neighbor is up here, and I'm over here. Because, you know, in Cape Coral, there are older homes that are low and higher homes that are uh, up a little, uh, newer homes that are up a little higher. So I came up with the idea, well, maybe the ground thing is throwing them off. So I started saying above street level, because on your, in your neighborhood, that street better be the same level from start to finish. You know, it's, it's not going to be like that. But it still was confusing, and um, it, it's just a, a, a matter of adapting to that. What it means, scientifically, is there is a high probability that the Gulf of Mexico will be in your neighborhood up to whatever number is in the range that is forecast for you. And we could have maybe a 10 to 15 foot storm surge in your downtown Fort Myers, but a 5 to 10 for Cape Coral. Well, that doesn't make sense. Fort Myers is up the river and we're closer to the Gulf. But here's the problem with Fort Myers. You don't want to leave Cape Coral to move to Fort Myers. Let me convince you of that right now. <laughs> Seriously. If that surge comes into the mouth of the Caloosahatchee, it's going to overflow both sides. But as it goes up the path of least resistance, which is up the river, the river gets narrower and the river gets shallower. So where is all of that water going? It's going to overlap both banks, but we have storm surge models that show at Wink Television, we could have a 15 foot storm surge in town while Fort Myers Beach has six to eight feet. So, you know, there's a, there's a miscalculation in some folks' mind. I don't live at the beach, so I don't have to worry about storm surge, and that is not true. Depends where you live and the other factors involved. Hi, I was just wondering, I've got a carport and I gotta get a generator, where the heck do you put it? The best is to talk to the generator companies that are licensed. Uh, they will have strong recommendations of placement, but also the important thing of that generator placement would be protection from the weather, and then also making sure that you're not inducing any carbon monoxide from its operation indoors. So if you would have a window nearby that might not be sealed to the greatest extent, or for some reason you have an air intake on your HVAC unit that would pull any air in, you don't want that generator being able to exhaust that carbon monoxide and have that come into your home. So from that perspective, it's just protection from the weather, making sure that it's appropriately installed by a licensed contractor, and they'll give you other information to make sure that it's getting strapped down correctly and not putting that CO level into your home. Can I put a quick note on that? Sure can. Back in the days of Charlie, uh, too bad the fire chief isn't here because the Cape Coral Fire Department, they did something incredible. Now, Charlie, we weren't as savvy about generators as we are now. And it's not just your generator, but you gotta watch out for your neighbor. Where's he putting his? What happened when they were driving around the city after Charlie left and everybody that had generators was running them, they would note which one doesn't seem like it's in a safe location. And they would knock on the door. And in multiple instances, they went in with an instrument that can measure carbon monoxide. And in many instances, they found lethal amounts of carbon monoxide already in the house. Now, I am convinced that if they hadn't done that and fixed that situation, that family would have gone to bed at night and some of them would not have woken up because carbon monoxide is odorless, tasteless, can't see it. It's, it could be in this room and you wouldn't know it. It's not. <laughs> but it's sneaky.
Yeah, if everybody didn't hear her question, are there any programs that help you pay for storm shutters and everything? We used to have that when we had the My Safe Florida Home Program. Unfortunately, the state of Florida hasn't funded that anymore. So there aren't any programs that I know of per se. However, if you do put shutters on your home, you should contact your insurance company because you're probably going to see some kind of discount from it. It's not a huge discount, but it's something. So, you know, you'll, you'll spend, obviously, the money up front for shutters, but even if you save 5 7 maybe even 10% for having them, that's better than nothing. I can answer your question. There is a program out there. I'm, I'm Mark Myloff from StormSmart, and uh, they have a program called PACE where you can finance the whole thing through, um, through uh, your mortgage and things like that. So there are programs out there, and uh, we, we accept that now too. Excellent. Thank available. you for sharing that. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> My question was pertaining to when you want to put a generator outside your house, where? Um, I've seen commercials, usually they're, you know, outside of your house on the side of, I would almost ex expect them to be the opposite side of the air conditioner. Um, but here, because I'm from Maryland, I just moved here, putting them on the ground seems like a really bad idea. I mean, do they make like, I don't know, stands or some sort of scaffolding or something that you can put your generator on top of that wouldn't vent anywhere but outside? Um, good question. Depending on what type of generator you use, whether if you have, if you go to say one of the big box stores and buy a generator to power part of your house, um, most of those are on wheels. I mean, you could, elevate it up, um, use of any pallets, anything of that nature to the side. Um, as far as, you know, I think Jim said it good, is you want to keep it out of the way of any, by any HVAC, anything like that. Um, one of the things that people worry about, and that's why, as we were saying with Charlie, we were, we're so concerned is that people, one of the big things is when you're out of power for two to three weeks, people get kind of crazy. And we were seeing generator thefts. So that's why people thought, oh yeah, if you left your generator outside, people in, in times of need will take extreme measures. So those people would say, oh, well, I'm gonna put it inside my garage, this way I'm not gonna have to worry about my generator getting stolen. Well, leave it inside in closed space, it gives off carbon monoxide. They do make, you know, I've seen people that have had generator pads put on the side of their homes, away from any air conditioner intakes, and you can actually have, <clears throat> Excuse me, you can have security like as far as being able to chain the generator to your house. I mean, we've seen people that have done that that don't have the generator systems where you can actually put it on a, you can have a little three by four foot pad poured, set the generator there, have it to where you can actually have an electrician come out and have a generator hook up to where it will feed right into your power box and you can plug your generator in right there, it's securely chained to the side of your house and then you don't have to worry about any theft or anything like that because uh, we, we've seen it all. I mean, people do crazy things when the power goes off. One thing I will add about that, generators, and, and that's why you're here tonight, because you're doing some planning ahead. You have to determine whether you want what's called a whole house generator that is always there, that automatically comes on, or if you're going to be okay with a small temporary one. Obviously, the whole house one costs more, more labor, more price up front and everything. But the thing to remember about the temporary ones is it may not power everything in your house. A lot of those generators that you buy at the big box stores may be big enough to run, you know, a couple of fans, a light here and there, but it's not going to run your water heater, your air conditioner, your range, your dryer all at once. Those, and also you have to make sure it's properly hooked up because you know, the worst person you could ever listen to is your brother-in-law. That's a standing joke I've ever used. Everybody has a brother-in-law that knows everything about construction. And one of the things they tell you is, well, you can just backfeed your generator through your dryer plug. Have you, you've probably heard that before. You can put the same plug on your dryer and plug it in. You know what the worst part about that is? It works. So your brother-in-law is there. He's like, yeah, hey, see, I told you. He's standing there drinking a beer. But what you've done is if your generator is not big enough for your house, you can overload the generator, cause it to short out and cause a fire. 
or more commonly what happens is you're sending energized power back through the house to any down lines that are down in the street. So your neighbors, everybody thinks, oh, the power's off, these lines are down, somebody touches those, they get electrocuted, it's a bad day for somebody. So all that being said, one of the big things you need to decide at this point is, do I want a whole house generator or am I okay with a temporary one? Then you can start researching to make that decision. Correct. Well, one of the big things to think about is you're probably not going to be using that, even if it's a portable generator, you're not going to be using it during the storm. Obviously, because there's a risk of it blowing away, the idea, like you just said, to go put gas in it during the storm. So you're probably only going to use it, and as Jim said, the storm's going to go by quickly. That next day, it's going to be probably bright and sunny, so that's when you're going to start using it. So that's, you know, that's another thing to consider. Do I want to have to, you know, wait in line for gas? Do I want to have to feed it? Am I worried about the security that Bill mentioned? Or that's when folks say, hey, maybe I want to spend a little bit more. I have the whole house generator. It's hooked up to LP, natural gas, whatever it might be. And with a start, with a push of a button, my house is powered. But those are the kind of things to think about now and not also, as you had mentioned earlier, Jim, you know, two days before the storm's out. If he's telling you there's a storm coming, I don't want to say it's too late, but you should have been thinking about that now, and that's why you all are here, because you're, you're intent on doing that now and not waiting to the last minute. The other issue, too, is a lot of times when you go with a smaller unit, there's an intermediate box that goes into play. And typically, the, the smaller wheel generators are going to power about six 15-amp circuits and there's a marshalling box that goes in between that you physically have to select. Do you want that circuit on line power, which is your everyday power, or do you want it running off generator? And what that does is it isolates that circuit. So that way when the generator is powering up that circuit, the circuit is actually isolated away from the typical line power that's coming into your home, rendering it safe to electrical workers out in the field, but powering up your circuit indoors. The big thing is also is a lot of those systems have meters on it that you can read the amperage that is the draw onto that circuit. So it allows protection then, so you're protecting that line as well. And again, it's basically six 15 amp circuits and also they, typically you're allowed one uh, 20 amp uh, double pull circuit, but you would have to pull away from single circuits then to accomplish that double pull. And that would typically be if you have a split unit air conditioner that typically pulls only 15 amps, that's just one smaller air conditioner that you could utilize. And a lot of people, what they're doing now is putting that split unit in and actually cooling one room of their home and allowing that to be their storm ready room because that uh, split unit has a low amperage draw and it can run off of that generator safely and still provide cooling to one room of your home. What, correct. What, ha what happens with it is having a licensed electrician come in, what they'll do is from that marshalling box that I talked about inside your home, it pulls the, those circuits from your regular power box into that marshalling box for the generator. And then there is a single line that comes off of that and typically is then through your home, you know, an exterior wall, and then there's a circuit or, or a uh, plug outside that the generator plugs into. So you're really, from that perspective, not running a bunch of electric cords, you know, under doorways, which is not really safe or advised because then it becomes a trip hazard and a fire hazard. It's pre-wired in by the licensed electrician. Right, and what typically should be done by a licensed electrician is that cord that goes from that box, it actually is in conduit. It goes through your wall to a receptacle outside that then there's, it's called an electrical pigtail that's plugged into the generator and then plugs into that external uh, receptacle outside, and that's the plug-in that powers that marshalling box inside your home. <laughs> 
And the dog wasn't crazy about that either, right? <laughs> Other questions? My question is concerning the garage doors and what you were talking about. Is there some place online we could go to find out how to make sure your garage door is as sturdy as it should be and what else in case of hurricanes coming, you know, what can people do? Sure. Uh, there's actually apps within the big box stores that will tell you based on this size garage door, whether it's uh, one, two, or multiple uh, bracing uh, supports that go in. There's horizontal bracing to brace up your door, but also vertical bracing as well. And it's all dependent upon size and uh, makeup of your garage door. Do either of you want to add? The other thing I will add, it's also based on the age of your garage door. So. As Alvin said, you can buy a whole series of different bracings, vertical posts, et cetera. The one thing to remember is those are an, an active measure. So when the storm's coming, you have to make sure you deploy those. One of the things to consider is if you're living in a house that has a garage door from 1970, 1975 or so, that door is probably already old and tired from going up several thousand times. Somebody's probably already bumped it a couple times here and there you might consider just replacing the door with a wind-rated impact door. Obviously, there's a, a cost up front, but then your protection is based on you walking over to the wall, pressing the button, putting the door down, your house is protected. Particularly if you live here seasonally as well, you don't have to be home to have your door protected because if your door is impact and wind-rated for the area, as long as it's down, it's doing its job. You don't have to worry about putting up any posts or brace. So the post and brace and all those things is a great idea if your door is newer and you, know, you don't want to spend the money on a, on a brand new door. But if you're looking at a door that's already 30, 40 years old, it's kind of crooked, it's got some dents in it, it's, it's rusting out, get some prices from garage door installers, licensed ones, of course, and make sure that you can you know, get apples for apples. So you might spend, I don't know, I'm making up numbers, but $2,000 for a brand new door that's you know, fully wind rated and everything as opposed to spending $1,100 on bracing and posts that are only gonna be as good as that old door is in the long run. Keep it in the garage, definitely. Carport, the thing to remember though is how strong is your carport? Are the posts that are holding it to the ground anchored? Are there any kind of hurricane clips or reinforcement where the roof of the post meets? What's the material of the carport? Those are things to consider because one of the greatest or worst things that could happen is the carport itself comes down on your car. going to say it's five minutes till 7.30, so out of respect for your time and following our guidelines, I want to say that we are, have the drawing for the weather radios. Um, so do we have... All right. Okay. <laughs> and so for, for the record, these are solar-powered weather radios that also have the capacity to play normal weather, AM, FM stations as well. So... Our first one is Joyce Ott. Yay! <laughs> Our second choice is Keith Vander Band Vanderbozil. Keith, is there Keith in the audience? <laughs> All right. Tracy Jeremiah. That's a lot easier to read. <laughs> That's the same guy. Yeah, he's loaded the box. Perry Roberts. John Southworth. Thank you. 
Walter Zanardi. Hey. <laughs> We got three left, folks. Beth Zanardi. Oh, yeah. Let's take a let's take another one. Ryan Roger Klein. Two more. Okay. Ken Locke. Hey. hey. Let me pick the last one. Last one. Kay Owens. <laughs> all right. So now, for all you recipients that have their bags, can you hold them up for us? So if you look at these bags, they all say CERT. Yay! So as I said earlier, I am the coordinator, program manager of the CERT program. We have a great team of volunteers. We've trained over 1,700 people over the last 22 years. Um, currently have about 216 active folks, and uh, we have a training coming up in August. And we would love to have you come out to learn more about us and to learn more about how you can give back to the city and become prepared to respond to not just hurricanes, but a variety of different emergencies. So if you have any questions, feel free to stop by me, or we have a little table out there with some flyers. Um, we, like I said, the next class is coming up in August. But otherwise, thank you folks for coming out, and uh, have a happy hurricane season. Just one exercise in closing. I like what Riley did earlier about the stretch. Let's, let's, if we could, stand up and just start clapping your hands together for me. I told Riley he was going to do an awesome job tonight. He planned this from the get-go. I knew he was going to get a standing ovation tonight. So Riley, excellent job tonight.